And there are some Christmas traditions here in Studio 1A we just can't do without. One, the eggnog flowing backstage That's and right here right. on this little table That's here. Right, man. <laughs> and the other, our favorite eggnog partaker joining us to talk about uh, the real reason for the season, his imminence. Timothy Cardinal Dolan, the Archbishop of New York. Cardinal, welcome back. Craig Thank you for and coming Chanel, in. Yes. A blessed Christmas. Blessed it's Christmas It's good to, to be you. with you. Uh, Absolutely. You had some of this already? Oh, yes. I'm trying to kind of slow down. It won't be the 12 days of Christmas. It could be the 12-step program. <laughs> Today, we are taking a trip down the rabbit hole to look into the dark and mysterious side of physics that often gets ignored. Sometimes those with scientific minds get sidetracked down a different path. What happens when one of the best scientists the world has ever known decides to mix their love of science with magic and the occult? 101 totally cool science experiments for kids. <laughs> you know, because you're so into science. <laughs> No. <laughs> it's not enough, is it? <laughs> Here. Saturnalia miracle. <laughs> Osiris was one of the most important gods of ancient Egypt. He was the god of fertility, resurrection, life, and vegetation. He was also the first ruler of Egypt who brought civilization and justice to the land. However, his brother Set was jealous of his power and plotted to kill him. Set tricked Osiris into a coffin and threw it into the Nile River. Isis, the wife and sister of Osiris, searched for his body and found it in Byblos. She brought it back to Egypt and tried to revive him, but Set stole the body and cut it into 14 pieces. Overseas now to that high-stakes presidential election in France this weekend. Voters will choose between a conservative nationalist and a young centrist who just got a big endorsement from former President Barack Obama. Our chief foreign correspondent, Terry Moran, is tracking that race. Good morning, Terry. Good morning, Robin. The French election is big news around the world, not just because France is an important country, but because it's the next chapter in that big debate we're all having. Nationalism versus globalization, anti-immigration versus pro-immigration. And in this highly unusual move by a former president, Barack Obama is weighing in. I am supporting Emmanuel Macron to lead you forward. French presidential hopeful Emmanuel Macron getting a very big endorsement from former U.S. President Barack Obama. He appeals to people's hopes and not their fears. A high stakes election in France set for Sunday has gotten the world's attention. Populist Marine Le Pen, an admirer of President Trump, is the anti-European Union, anti-immigrant, and anti-Islam candidate. Emmanuel Macron's platform, pro-EU, pro-trade, and more tolerant. The Obama endorsement, an attempt by Macron to tap into the former president's strong support among the French. And right now, Macron's got the upper hand, a double-digit lead in the poll. He's just 39, a novice, and he brings with him a unique personal story. His closest collaborator, his wife, Brigitte. She is 25 years older than he. They met when he was 15, and she was his drama teacher and married with three children, one a classmate of Macron. His parents forcibly separated them for years, but their love would not be denied, and they married years later in 2007 after she divorced her husband. She is constantly by his side, advising on policy, editing his speeches. And the French, whose presidents often have colorful private lives, have warmly accepted the couple. And she calls herself the president of his fan club. Well, the couple have no children of their own. Macron's oldest stepson is two years older than he is. But Brigitte's youngest daughter from her first marriage, she now works for her stepdad's campaign. And she says they're the happiest couple she's ever seen. I'm going to vote blue. Vote for who you want. This is a free dictatorship. Simply put, this country and this world benefit from your commitment to Jesuit principles, to being men.
being uh, introduced to the president by Ambassador Peter Selfridge, the chief of protocol. And now moving to the front row of the U.S. welcoming. <laughs> As a graduate of another great Jesuit institution, Xavier University, I have great affection for the value and purpose of a Jesuit education. On France's Mediterranean coast, thousands line the streets of Marseille to see the leader of the world's Catholics. The Pope and his Popemobile arriving at the city's stadium. Just days ago, it hosted a Rugby World Cup match. Today, an open-air mass for tens of thousands of the faithful. Bonjour, Marcel. Bonjour, la France. The pontiff, now regularly confined to a wheelchair to limit time on his bad knee, took to his feet to meet the president and used his position to tell the country's bishops Europe's migrant crisis is not an emergency. The solution is not to reject arrivals, he said, but open more ways for people to come to Europe. Earlier this month, 5,000 migrants landed on the Italian island of Lampedusa in one day. European governments have vowed to bolster border security. We will decide who comes to the European Union and under what circumstances. The Pope accused politicians of alarmist propaganda, leaving France after wading deep into political war. Tumbling back to earth, the secrets of the universe. Namely, a few hundred grams of dust from an asteroid called Bennu, which may, scientists believe, give us the first clue about the formation of the planets. Bennu, we think, formed right at the beginning of the solar system, four and a half billion years ago. And it's basically deep, been deep frozen since that time. So it's going to tell us what was around before the planets were around. Congratulations to you if you believe that. It's called education, indoctrination and dumbing down. I imagine that right now you're feeling a bit like Alice, tumbling down the rabbit hole. Hey, what's up? It's Jack Black from the Netflix movie Apollo 10 and a half, A Space Age Childhood. Now, we all know that NASA's Apollo program brought humans to the moon for the first time. But what about the next time? Why has nobody been to the moon in such a long time? <laughs> That's not uh, an eight-year-old's question. <laughs> That's my question. I want to know, but I think I know. Because we didn't go there, and, and that's the way it happened. Well, very soon we will be launching Artemis 1, the flight test of the rocket and spacecraft that will bring humans to the moon again. And NASA wants to see your excitement. Show everyone all your moon-inspired content with hashtag NASA Moon Snap, and NASA will show some of them on social media and during the launch broadcast. We're talking moon hats, moon photos, moon latte foam art. If it's got a moon on it, send it in. The spacecraft nestled inside a Centaur upper stage launches on an Atlas V rocket with a single solid rocket booster. The rocket's first stage separates. And then the Centaur upper stage fires. The fairings separate from the rocket.
and the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft releases from the Centaur upper stage. Angled toward the sun, the spacecraft deploys its solar arrays. Now traveling over 25,000 miles per hour, OSIRIS-REx escapes Earth's gravity and begins its cruise toward asteroid Bennu. The Bennu is one of the most ancient deities in Egypt, related to creation and rebirth, and regarded as the original inspiration for the Phoenix legends. Professor, so your bird. There was nothing I could do. He, he just caught fire. Oh, and about time too. He's been looking dreadful for days. Pity you had to see him on a burning day. Fox, is a phoenix, Harry. They burst into flame when it is time for them to die, and then they are reborn from the ashes. Fascinating creatures, phoenixes. They can carry immensely heavy loads and their, their tears of healing powers. Professor Dumbledore, sir. From the fading light of life, rise like a phoenix. It is generally pictured as a huge grey heron wearing a pharaoh's crown. According to an ancient myth, Bennu flew over the waters of Nun, the primeval ocean that existed before creation, and landed on a rock and issued a call that determined the nature of creation. It was believed that Bennu was immortal, capable of renewing himself periodically. It too was a symbol of rebirth, and was constantly associated with Osiris, it was frequently seen as one of the forms taken by the god of the underworld to visit the world of mortals. The Bennu was featured in many ancient paintings and on funerary amulets as a symbol of rebirth. Franklin Delano Roosevelt, who solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute the office of President of the United States and will, to the best of my ability, preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States, so help me God. On top of the Capitol Dome in Washington, you can see the Goddess of Freedom, also known as Semiramis, Queen of Babylon, who later became Isis of Egypt. Now, we suggest the dome itself represents the womb of the goddess. So, if the dome represents the womb of the goddess, we should find nearby the phallus of the god, ready to impregnate her and bring forth the spirit of the sun god. And we most certainly do. Facing the dome is the phallus of the sun god, the Washington Monument. During his research for his book, Apollyon Rising 2012, Dr. Tom Horn traveled to Washington, D.C., where he met with Masons at the House of the Temple, the headquarters of the Supreme Council of the Scottish Rite. Horn says these men were very cordial and mostly responsive to his questions. They even confirmed his understanding of the influence of Freemasonry in American history. It was only when he pressed one of them about a ritual called the Raising Ceremony, the raising of Osiris from the dead, it's also known as, which is conducted in the temple room on the third floor of the building. It's only then that these masons became evasive and visibly uncomfortable. The reason for this, according to Dr. Horn, is that in addition to the raising ceremony being conducted when members reach the 33rd degree of Scottish Rite Freemasonry, 
This strange ceremony is performed without public knowledge in this very temple room at the inauguration of every United States president. Why is that? Because deep esoteric meaning behind Egyptian and Rosicrucian magic that was incorporated into the rites and rituals of Freemasonry hold that the spirit of Osiris can be raised from the underworld and installed, for want of a better term, in the reigning king or president. According to Tom Horn, this is why the US Capitol Dome is laid out so as to face the obelisk the phallus of the sun god known as the Washington Monument. An interesting point regarding the obelisk in Washington, the Washington Monument. The column is 6,666 inches high and each side is 666 inches long. Now, obviously, this cannot be an accident because we remember that the Antichrist's number in the Bible is 600 and 66. Jack Parsons was born Marvel Whiteside Parsons in October of 1914 and would spend much of his formative years in the areas around Los Angeles. From an early age, he suffered with a number of difficulties including dyslexia, which made his time at school very difficult and was on the receiving end of much bullying. But his love of science and specifically explosives and their applications began to grow from an early age and he quickly developed a knack for them. He eventually dropped out of college when he got his first job working at the Hercules Powder Company, where he began his work with various types of chemicals and explosives in order to discover new ways of combining them to increase their power. Parsons was the first person to develop a castable composite rocket propellant, and his contributions would greatly advance the fields of solid fuel as well as liquid fuel rockets. He would eventually go on to co-found one of the biggest names in rocketry that is still in operation today. If you were to just hear about these parts of his life, he would seem much like many of the other scientists at the time. But Jack was leading another life as well, one with a deep respect for the current day occult leaders like Aleister Crowley and filled with magic rituals and practices that would help fuel his dream of building a rocket strong enough to reach the moon at a time when much of the current scientific community thought that achievement still in the realm of science fiction. From his early career, Jack set himself apart from his peers with an unparalleled understanding of explosives and how he could mix them together to create new compounds with far more firepower. Throughout his life, his work has paved the way for the modern field of rocketry. And before Parsons' time, there was really no such thing as rockets as we think of them today. He was the first scientist to invent a new type of solid fuel that could be loaded into a specially designed engine that will burn and produce an enormous amount of thrust. This work quickly got him noticed by many of the big names in science, which led him into positions at some of the top research companies of the time, as well as work on top secret government projects. But many of the people who supported his professional career didn't have any clue at that time about the other major passion in his life, magic. From his time as a teenager, Parsons had maintained an interest in the occult, specifically the group Ordo Templis Orientis, run by Aleister Crowley, and everything else that was included in his magical practice of Thelema. Rituals to summon spirits, elementals, and other otherworldly beings became a regular thing for Parsons, as he attempted to gain more knowledge and power from the supernatural in order to further his work. He spent a couple of years with Crowley, which brought him further into occult teachings, which would eventually lead him to the point he wanted to perform his own massive ritual towards the end of his life. This ritual would go on to be called the Babylon Working, and would aim to end the current age of the world and begin the dawn of the new one by calling forth a divine archetypal named Babylon. 
After 23 months, the spacecraft arrives at asteroid Bennu in August 2018. With its suite of observational instruments, OSIRIS-REx orbits the asteroid, studying its characteristics and mapping its surface. After four phases of survey observations, OSIRIS-REx begins preparations to collect the sample. In July 2020, after months of rehearsals and study, the spacecraft approaches for sample collection. It slowly descends to Bennu's surface at less than a quarter mile per hour. With an outstretched arm, OSIRIS-REx briefly touches the surface. The touch-and-go sample acquisition mechanism, TAGSAM, blows high-pressure nitrogen gas into the surface rocks and dust, sending loose asteroid material up into the TAGSAM head. OSIRIS-REx backs away from Bennu and stows the sample in a capsule for its journey to Earth. In March 2021, the window opens for OSIRIS-REx to depart Bennu. The spacecraft returns to Earth September 24, 2023 and jettisons the sample return capsule. The spacecraft leaves Earth and the return capsule enters the Earth's atmosphere at over 27,000 miles per hour, protected by a heat shield. A couple miles above the surface, a parachute deploys. And the capsule lands softly in the Utah desert. Bennu's secrets can now be investigated for decades to come. During his time deepening his understandings and workings in magic, he was also continuing to advance his career in rocketry and in the year 1942, he founded a new company. Jack, along with a number of other big names in early rocketry at the time, founded a company that still remains one of the top institutions for rocketry in the world today, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, or JPL, in Pasadena, California. Here, they set out with the goal to improve on the rocket engines they had already designed in an attempt to make them strong enough to take a rocket out through the layers of the atmosphere and into space. The new laboratory soon got noticed by NASA and the U.S. government and began working with them to develop new technologies. JPL has always maintained a good working relationship with NASA, but their feelings on Parsons were not so comfortable. Many of the scientists and higher-ups working at NASA had their own thoughts on Jack Parsons, his interest in magic, and his willingness to merge it with his scientific endeavors. While Jack maintained that the magic he was practicing was real and would eventually be understood through the workings of quantum mechanics, most others at this time did not share this belief and looked at him with a cautious gaze. Parsons also continued to have a working relationship with many academics who were caught up in the anti-communist times of the Cold War which also caused a bit of negative attention to be cast down on him from people within the government. Eventually, this led to NASA ending all forms of their relationship with Parsons, essentially blocking him from ever gaining a security clearance to work on government projects again. After his expulsion from the professional world of rocketry, Jack would go on to work at other explosive companies as well as building pyrotechnics for Hollywood movies. Sadly, this time would not last long and the world would lose the genius scientist that was Jack Parsons when he was just 37 years old. As he was getting ready to go on a vacation one day, he got a rush order for explosives to be used in a new movie. While he was mixing the compounds, something went wrong which set off a chain reaction with the copious piles of explosive materials he kept at his house. This ultimately resulted in a powerful explosion that left him with injuries that would quickly lead to his death en route to the hospital. The world was left wondering what else he could have achieved if fate had turned out different that day. But the legacy of Jack Parsons lives on in his development of the modern field of rocketry, 
and his controversial partnership with many occult practitioners at that time. This, let me read the story to you. It's a, almost too crazy to be true. A janitor turned rocket scientist turned cult member who was also an alleged spy. It's the real life story of Jack Parsons. CBS drama is called Strange Angel. Second season uh, is, is now here. Uh, you, Bella, you play uh, Mrs. Parsons. What did you know about the life of Jack Parsons before you signed on to this? Uh, I knew nothing of the life of Jack Parsons. And I remember actually when it was first sent to me, I just thought, oh, this is too fantastical and didn't believe it. Uh, and then was told that it was a true story and read it and just, yeah, uh, it kind of blew my mind. And he, so he is this incredibly successful and accomplished scientist, mm -hmm. but he's also very immersed. Is it fair to call it a sex cult or sex religion? Or? I mean, that's what I'd call it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, Thalema, I, I would call it a sex cult, whether or not that's uh, okay. Okay, and for season two, uh, Mr. and Mrs. invite the cult into your own home. Yep, as you do. In Pasadena, no. <laughs> as you oh. do. As you yeah, do. yeah, as you do. As one does. Yeah, the more the merrier. Come on in. Uh, okay, and your si your character sister is involved as well. Yeah, uh, you know, much to my chagrin, I think, because she, you know, we're just in a bad situation at home with our stepfather, so I invite her in, but she is just trouble, and I'm trying mm. to uh, protect her from the cult because she's my younger sister, but she's, uh, I think I need protection from her more than anything. Well, there you are. Uh, that's a, a good lead into this clip. Take a look. I never wanted to be like Virgil pushing you into a faith you hadn't chosen for yourself. <laughs> Though it might be more difficult now, I don't want you to feel pressured to participate. I don't. Let me put it another way. Until you're ready, you won't be able to participate. Who gets to decide if I'm ready? In the meantime, there will have to be certain ground rules. You respect the privacy of all those living here, and during any kind of gathering, you're not to leave your bedroom. You can't be serious. I thought the whole point of this was to live with less rules, not more. Uh-oh, she's trouble. Oh, oh dear. Okay, and then Sassy. in real life, that character, the sister, yep. uh, went on to marry L. Ron Hubbard. Yeah. Uh, it, I, again, you couldn't make wow. this stuff up. I know. I, when I'm like giving people the summary, I'm like, so my husband, he's a janitor, <laughs> yeah. he invents rocket scientists, we get into this sex cult, and then my sister takes off with L. Ron Hubbard and he found Scientology, and everyone's like, what? <laughs> he has joined the group of physicists who dedicated their lives not only to science, but also to practices that try to shape the natural world through different means. He was not alone, and did you know that there have been quite a few famous scientists who also dabbled in more magical practices? You may be surprised to learn about some of them. The father of physicists and calculus Isaac Newton was an avid alchemist. He tried for many years to produce the fabled Philosopher's Stone, which he thought would help him to find the way of turning base metals into precious gold. A German physicist by the name of Johann Zollner, whose work is often credited as given many of the key ideas to higher dimensional physics. He believed in spiritualism and performed many experiments trying to prove the supernatural abilities of magicians and psychics of the time. Another famous scientist you may have heard of, J. Robert Oppenheimer, one of Parsons' contemporaries, was also a practicing occultist. Even going as far to perform a magical ritual with some of the atomic bomb tests during his time with Project Manhattan. These scientists and many more were able to be held in high regard in the scientific community, while also engaging in practices that were not supported by many scientists of the time. Looking through the scientists of the past, you don't have to go far to find one who believed in practices that we now consider to be fantasy. Earlier today, the spacecraft jettisoned its vital cargo, sending it screaming into the Earth's atmosphere at more than 27,000 miles an hour, where it landed gently in the Utah desert at 8 minutes to 4 UK time. Visual on the Earth's ocean. Potentially, missions like this may help us prevent um, horrendous asteroid strike on the Earth in the future. It's the culmination of a seven-year, four-billion-mile journey to Bennu. Liftoff of Osiris-Rex. A 78-million-ton chunk of rock dubbed the most dangerous in the solar system. So Newton simply threw his hands up and said, I don't know. So I'm going to invent something called gravitational pull. Although we weren't able to shatter that highest hardest glass ceiling this time. Thanks to you, 
It's got about 18 million cracks in it. Moab. Come again? What your reverend was ranting about. And his hearing aid must have intercepted a transmission like the ones that you're picking up at the radio station. But why would the army be telling Bible stories? Moab is not a city. It's an acronym. Moab. Mother of all bombs. That's what we call the largest non-nuclear missile in our arsenal. You think they're gonna launch that thing at the dome? Would it work? Yeah. Then why don't you look happy? Because it'll also kill everybody inside. What? Dodie, Visitor's Day was not about saying hello to your families. It was about saying goodbye. And it may be hard to see tonight, but we are all standing under a glass ceiling right now. And the light is shining through like never before, filling us all with the hope and the sure knowledge that the path will be a little easier next time. Force field. It's a dome. We're at the edge of the arena. Tomorrow's a very big day because tomorrow will represent 50 years from the time we planted a beautiful American flag on the moon. And uh, that was a, an achievement, possibly one of the great, considered one of the great achievements ever. And we're going a lot further now. We're going to the moon, but we're then going to Mars. Personally, I think the unconquered South Face is the only one worth scaling. It's a 20,000 foot sheer wall of ice, but that's never stopped me before. So, uh, so, so you spin, you know, when you spin pizza dough, it kind of flattens out. Yeah. It gets wider in the middle. And so Earth, throughout its life, even when it formed, it was spinning. And it got a little wider at the equator than it does at the poles. So it's not actually a sphere. It's, an, it's oblate. And officially, it's an oblate spheroid. That's what we call it. But not only that, it's slightly wider below the equator than above the equator. A little chubbier. A little chubbier. Yeah. Chubby's a good way. It's like pear-shaped. Isis and her sister Nephthys collected the pieces and reassembled them with the help of Anubis, the god of mummification. They wrapped Osiris in linen bandages and performed magic to resurrect him. Osiris became the lord of the underworld and the judge of the dead. He also fathered Horus, who avenged his death and became the new king of Egypt. Isis, Horus, set. Nothing to do with Jesus. Humans, for the most part, don't have a clue. They don't want one or need one either. They're happy. They think they have a good bead on things. Uh, well, why, why the big secret? People are smart. They can handle it. A person is smart. People are dumb, panicky, dangerous animals, and you know it. 1,500 years ago, everybody knew the Earth was the center of the universe. 500 years ago, everybody knew the Earth was flat. Thank you for setting up some time and truth and really, it means a lot. Okay? Continue. When you try your best but you don't succeed When you get what you want but not what you need when you feel so tired but you can't sleep Stuck in river Los adultos podemos aprender mucho de los jóvenes And the tears come streaming down your face CD02 data intact Initiating playback Elizabeth Sobek. 
You've heard the bad news, and it's all true. The Pharaoh Plague is devouring the biosphere. Life itself will cease to exist. But does that have to be the end? What if we could give life a future? What if we could build a kind of seed from which, on a dead planet, life could blossom anew? This is the aim, the hope, of Project Zero Dawn. To create a super-intelligent, fully automated terraforming system and bring life back from lifelessness. What would such a system require? At its core, it would need a true AI, fully capable of making the trillions of decisions necessary to reconstitute the biosphere. An immortal guardian, devoted to the reflourishing of life. We call it Gaia. Mother Nature as an AI. But that's just the core of the system. She will need to be surrounded and empowered by a comprehensive suite of subordinate functions. Think of them as extensions of Gaia's mind, each dedicated to a specific purpose. Now these aren't AIs, but make no mistake, each presents an engineering challenge more profound than anything the human species has ever before attempted. Hardware that preserves and then gestates the billions of seeds and embryos from which life will be reborn. The construction of underground facilities to hold it all. And that's just the start. We don't have to build the entire system. The beauty of a fully automated terraforming system is that it can build itself. Now over the days to come, you'll learn how all these functions, all these pieces that you'll be working on, fit together. How we'll race the clock to execute our harvest initiatives, write the software, build the tech and the facilities. How we'll lock it down and seal it up before the inevitable occurs. But even more important, you'll know how it doesn't end here. How Gaia will generate those deactivation codes General Harris talked about, and build the transmission arrays to broadcast them, shutting down the feral robots for good. How Gaia will not just build, but imagine any conceivable robot it needs to do its work across centuries. From detoxifying the Earth's ravaged atmosphere and poisoned seas, to the regreening of the Earth from cryopreserved seed stocks, to rewilding the Earth with animal life. And then, when all that is done, how a new generation of human beings, spawned at cradle facilities around the globe, will partake of Apollo. The vast archive of human knowledge and cultural achievement from which they will learn of us, our world. And most important, how not to repeat our mistakes. It's not an impossible dream. It is within our grasp if we work tirelessly and stop at nothing to achieve it. Hey, Sheldon, are you and Leonard putting up a Christmas tree? No, because we don't celebrate the ancient pagan festival of Saturnalia. <laughs> Saturnalia? In the pre-Christian era, as the winter solstice approached and the plants died, pagans brought evergreen boughs into their homes as an act of sympathetic magic intended to guard the life essences of the plants until spring. Uh, this custom was later appropriated by Northern Europeans, and eventually it becomes the so-called Christmas tree. <laughs> When I gave the word Now in the morning I sleep alone Sweep the streets I used to own
steroids. Santa Claus kicks and deals. It's a long fly ball going back, back. And the ball shatters the sky, bringing the ocean itself down into the stadium. Oh, Simpson just broke this dream's reality wide open. crystal clear that you and the other space programs that are in operation are connected and are deceiving the entire world. More and more people are waking up every single day and we are now able to see right through you.